Is it working? Yeah. Okay. So, well, first of all, thanks uh, to everybody for coming. This is a special event of the Foundations of Probability Seminar, which is primarily uh, organized today. Today's seminar was uh, a panel discussion organized by Glenn Schaefer. And so this is going to be a panel discussion as Glenn will explain more on memorialization or dememorialization, uh, which of which we've had uh, quite a bit of experience with in statistics and philosophy and related fields over the past year or so. And I think it's probably, I guess this was Glenn's idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of balanced conversation about this. So I think that hopefully this is a good time for that. And I'm looking forward to hear what the panelists had to say. So I'll leave it to Glenn from here. Uh, great, thank you, Harry. And thank you everyone for coming. Uh, uh, as he said, the uh, topic is both memorialization and dememorialization. I'm particularly interested, uh, you know, what has been raising passions has been the dememorializing part, but I'm particularly interested in the memorializing part. Why do we do this in the first place? Why do we uh, pick out uh, contributors to our, to the fields of statistics and philosophy in particular and name things after them? Uh, is it because they're good people? Uh, is it because, um, uh, you know, why is it and what justifies it? Um, I, I, there are people that, uh, you know, I have been, uh, I have been working, uh, this is kind of personal, but uh, I've been working in a field where we don't have uh, sort of the founders of it memorialized. And I, at one time I thought about promoting memorializing some of them. I don't think they were very good people. Uh, not admirable in all respects anyway. So uh, one of them, uh, for example, um, probably collaborated with the Nazis as, a, as an engineer, but his ideas were wonderful. So why can't we memorialize him or should we, or shouldn't we? Uh, so this is somebody who never has been memorialized in this way that maybe Hume or Fisher or uh, Galton were. So um, I'm interested in this question, what are we doing? Why are we doing it in the first place? So it's why memorialize, why dememorialize? Uh, and um, let me briefly mention our speakers. Uh, I will call on them in order. The first is a, a philosopher, uh, Dana Francisco Miranda uh, of the University of uh, Massachusetts, Boston. And he's written very thoughtfully about the complexity of memorialization. So that's what I really want to hear about. Uh, then there's my a very distinguished uh, historian, uh, Professor Emeritus at Princeton, who, as some of you, uh, we've been mentioning, uh, incidentally, uh, I'm married to her, uh, Nell Irvin Painter, and she's written about uh, these issues, about uh, 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 some of the um, memorial, some of the uh, memory that, you know, history and memory. Uh, I won't uh, offer the, well, Ver, Vergangenheitsbewaltigung is a French word for it. Uh, and then Professor Waldman, Felix Waldman at Cambridge University, who particularly, so those two, the, you know, we have the philosopher and then the historians, uh, Nell and Felix is an historian who had particularly uh, knows about David Hume uh, uh, and his investment in a slave plantation. And then we've got our historians of statistics, uh, Prakash Gurachurn, who's written a couple of very uh, powerful books, a big book uh, in particular, and has, is studying not only R.A. Fisher's work, has studied R.A. Fisher's work in statistics, but also in genetics. Uh, he's at Columbia University. And then finally, John Aldrich of the University of Southampton, who has studied all kinds of uh, a history with a of statistics and economics with an emphasis on the British. So these uh, people really know something about the topic. And uh, so I want to uh, uh, turn it over to them. I've asked each of them to speak for uh, no more than 10 minutes so that we'll have time for the uh, group to ask questions and maybe have them ask each other questions. So uh, Dana, 
uh, can we start with you? And uh, by the way, some of you might have some slides to share. That's fine. You can do that or you don't need to. Okay. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Thank you, Glenn, for the introduction. Thank you, um, Glenn, Nell, Harry, and Snow for putting together this seminar and this panel. I'm happy to be here. I have a tendency to over go over the time limit. So I'm really gonna try my best to stick the, to those 10 minutes. So because I've been working on monuments since I was an undergrad, um, it's been eight years now and my thought process has evolved. Even the piece that Glenn shared with you all, I've written pieces just over the past fall, um, four pieces that have really clarified how I see the work of monuments and memorialization. So I'm going to go over five categories rather briefly. They're going to be broad brushstrokes, but in the Q&A, I can take more specific questions and talk about particular philosophers, how they enter into the conversation. Because trust me, there are many philosophers who are idealized that have significant monuments um, that also face the same questions that you all might be interested in. Now, with that being said, the way I always begin talking about monuments and memorialization is through etymology. Um, to figure out what exactly do we mean by memorialization, monumentality, why do human beings go through the effort of constructing through concrete materials, stone, steel, glass, um, or through a public commemoration, a figure in their name? Well, so, okay, I've been highlighted. So in the Latin, we could either go to monere, which means to remind or warn, or memoria. Um, and this just means, again, memory. So the three terminologies I use interchangeably throughout my presentations and writings is that we might be called to do all three or at one in each moment. We might be called to remember, um, to keep alive a memory of something significant, a person, event, um, in our collective histories, particularly with public monuments, or we might be called as a reminder or a warning that this figure, this person, this event should never have happened, should never happen again in the future. Um, and Paul, I believe Cantor, um, sorry if I'm saying your last name incorrectly, um, but you wrote in the, during the tea time, a quote that is particularly salient. Um, Those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it or are doomed to repeat it. And much of this same thought process is involved with the work of monuments or memorialization and dememorialization. So brief note that when we talk about monuments, the etymology is important. But if you look at the actual practice, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, you see certain features be highlighted. Not all monuments do the exact same work, and it's important to know this difference. So some monuments are called simply as representation of the facts or events, something, the founding of Chicago, the founding of Boston. This is just a founding date and we're gonna represent this moment as a founding or origin. Um, they can also be endorsement. So you have political figures. We're gonna put a monument because that person did something significant and we want to endorse this figure as something representative for all our citizens or communities. Um, we also have remembrance. We have the idea of permanence, narrative functions. Um, we also have monuments serving as sites of reconciliation. So the Bunker Hill Monument, which many people outside of Massachusetts don't even know. Um, I always just say, if you know the George Washington Monument, a white marble obelisk, think in miniature. That's the Bunker Hill Monument. But during the, af well, right after the Civil War, um, Union generals and presidents actually met at that site because they wanted to reunify the entire nation. So the site where the first American blood was spilled versus the British, they met to reconcile the nation. There's also monuments to mourning and monuments to celebration. I, I always point to the Freedom Towers and the 9-11 Memorial as doing that work. But what calls us all here today and is very poignant in the title that I don't know if Glenn um, picked out, but, um, or if it's a collective, but worthy of study, intellectual contributions. Um, for our philosophers, for statisticians, for historians, there are also people in our fields that have made vast intellectual contributions that they've done something essential to our field and we want future generations to also know that contribution. That's essential knowledge to continue the learning process. 
Now, if we take that worthy of study, that intellectual contribution as one facet of memorialization, again, it's multifaceted. There are many different ways to memorialize. What you frequently encounter or more recently during the summer with Black Lives Matter protests, where you had monuments being torn down, vandalized, with buildings and halls being having their name changed. Again, the discussion of David Hume, um, um, Faneuil, uh, Peter Faneuil in Boston. Again, many sites across the world were entering into these conversations is do some people not deserve the honor of being remembered in a public way? So when we're talking about intellectual contributions, you can talk about cancel culture. Um, you can talk about the erasure of history. You can talk about presentism. Again, the act of judging the past through modern moral considerations. You can talk about slippery slopes. If you tear down one monument to one figure, uh, then all the monuments have to go down. There are many arguments against dememorialization. Um, I can get into these arguments in the Q&A, but I just wanna talk about the process of dememorializing it says, again, removal. It can be deascension. It can be on an unnaming, but this process says, regardless of the reason why this person was memorialized in the first place, this present generation has found some reason, has some, found some fault, that deems them unworthy. It's a process of saying unworthy of remembrance or at least public remembrance. Now, at this particular moment, many people then say, well, memorialization has historical benefit. It seems to be a human process. Why all of a sudden are people tearing down significant figures? And for me, this is where I step in with my literature, uh, my background in philosophy, my work in the area and say, well, actually the process of memorialization and dememorialization or dememorializing are very similar. Um, and they're similar in the dimensions they highlight, but what they find salient or the end result is different. So one obviously includes an erection um, sometimes a ritual to um, cement that site in public. The other one is a removal. Those processes are quite different, erection and removal. However, the reasons why people go through the process are for me, philosophy, um, using philosophy are quite similar. So as I moved forward this past summer and fall, I thought of the idea of multidimensionality and I'm just gonna explain it briefly, the dimensions um, the reasons why I added on to my previous thoughts, and then I'll let the next um, speaker go, because I know I'm nearing that time limit. But multidimensionality really says that there are key dimensions or categories involved in the process of memorializing or dememorializing. Monuments don't simply represent history. They're not just representations of historical facts or objective lessons or history. Um, history is one element. Um, we can say what histories are evident, what histories are important. They have political dimensions where the public interest, um, they can be used politically like the 9-11 Memorial. That, that also had a political usage to it or the Bunker Hill Monument I mentioned. There's the aesthetic dimension. Again, the beauty, the actual design features. Um, some monuments are kept in place simply due to their aesthetics. All history has been lost all political meaning has been lost, but there's something about its beauty or aesthetic value that we keep alive in our publics. And lastly, the ethics or the ethical dimension. And here I'm speaking to not only what is right or wrong, but is this monument morally offensive? Did the figure involved support something morally wrong? So in philosophy, Martin Heidegger in his famous support of Nazism, does that mean due to support that we can't study Heidegger or we shouldn't elevate him within the field? Um, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but outside of those four dimensions, I've also added the intellectual value to really bring home their contributions um, to knowledge that we also find important that aren't captured within those dimensions. But whatever dimension you use, what you usually come up with if if memorializing and dememorializing utilize all five dimensions, then what is key are the stakeholders and the salience factors. 
So who's involved in actually deciding what gets erected or what gets a room? Is it the wider public? Is it the students at a college? Um, is it the faculty? Who are the significant stakeholders of a public monument? And second, which dimension is most salient? So while we're looking at a monument or, or deciding whether to take it down or remove a name from a hall, we can also consider, well, maybe the political dimension actually is more salient. There may be still present past issues involved in our society with racism, sexism, that hasn't been dealt with. And in order to move past this, maybe it requires an unnaming or dememorializing. Um, again, this is very complicated, but I want to show the complexity of monuments. Um, that in both memorializing and dememorializing, they utilize all five of these dimensions, but they also have stakeholders and salience factors. Um, and with that, I think I'm one minute past. Um, so I'll leave it there. But again, I'm more than happy. I brought figures in my notes in philosophy that really can bring home this multidimensionality. But I'm also more than happy to hear it for all the listeners, all the speakers, and take a lot of questions. So thank you, Glenn. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you for showing an example, not uh, uh, going over too far. So the, we uh, have time for uh, four more people. Uh, and we'll move on to Nell uh, to talk about uh, uh, the need for uh, uh, memory. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for letting me join this seminar that I've been a kind of step member of for so many years. Um, I want to talk about uh, commemoration of great men, and they are all men, and talk about the historian, the French historian, who uh, is the founder of the study of history and memory, which is what we're doing. Uh, his name is Pierre Nora, um, recently deceased uh, in the 1990s uh, in Paris. I was able to sit in in his seminar in the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales. What Pierre Nora called uh, lieu de mémoire, places of memory or memory sites. Um, these are places where memory crystallizes and secretes itself. So there are places that society deems um, uh, crucial and they are perpetual. They're perpetual actual phenomena and they tie us to an eternal present. So memory is a thing that only accommodates the facts that it likes. Um, in the present cases, we are talking about lieu de mémoire. We're talking about Fisher's stained glass window, uh, Latin Square. We're talking about Fisher's now retired honorary lectureship um, and an at annual statistics meetings. We're talking about Galton's endowed professorship, Pearson's lecture hall and Hume's tower at the University of Edinburgh. These are all lieu de mémoire. Um, so there's a timelessness embedded in each of these commemorations, in each of these lieux de mémoire. Um, so Noha contrasts um, memory, these timeless uh, commemorations, with history. So whereas the sites of memory seek to capture a timeless relation to the past, history can change. Uh, history changes its meaning as historians have come to recognize the history of history, what we call historiography. So historiography is the study of how historical, um, how history changes. And it's mostly a creature of the 20th century, especially after the era of Nazism, uh, of the Holocaust, and in the USA and the UK, um, after grappling with white supremacy and, uh, and um, misogyny. 
So Glenn mentioned the name Vergegenheitsbewältigung, which means coming to terms with the past. It's not exactly the same as dealing with lieu de mémoire, but in order to come to terms with the past, you also need to come to terms with lieu de mémoire. So if there's a timelessness about the lieu de mémoire, the places of memory and memory commemoration, there's um, a history of history. There's a historiography of change over time, the way historians uh, change the way they ask questions of the past, and also of uh, querying who are the greats, um, how do you become a great, do we need to continue to recognize the old greats like Galton and Fisher? So the old way of thinking about history, that is before the Second World War, we associate with uh, Leopold von Ranke um, and his ideal of writing history was how it actually was experienced. And this approach of trying to make history the way it was actually lived doesn't ask how history, history or historical documents get made and collected. So it doesn't allow for a basic characteristic of the writing of history. Um, that is that new people ask new questions and find new answers. For me, one of the most important aspects of writing history is that the past changes as the questions change. Different historians and different times change the shape of history, change the shape of what is considered historical importance. As Pierre Nora says, history is a representation of the past, how societies organize the past. So history can't be an innocent operation because historians have a stake in the past, but that's also true of monuments. In 2020, um, anti-racist consciousness coming out of the George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, um, as Daryl said, um, intensified uh, an ongoing movement to dismantle Confederate monuments in my own University of Princeton, it wasn't exactly Confederate monuments because in New Jersey, there may be one, but only one and it's not at Princeton. Um, the question at Princeton was about Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, a uh, pivotal uh, president of the university, a, a president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson was uh, a Virginian of pronounced white supremacist views. The anti-Woodrow Wilson movement at Princeton started um, in 2015. Actually, it started before that because my last um, Princeton PhD student, Eric Yellen, wrote a dissertation on Woodrow Wilson segregation of the, the federal um, workforce. But in 2015, student protests asked that his name be removed. And the response from the university was to create a, a committee um, under a distinguished black alumnus. Um, and the, in 2016, the response was more DEI, more diversity, more equity, more inclusion and a revision of the way that the university's history was written, but Woodrow Wilson's name was left intact. In 2020, after all the upheaval and the demonstrations, which I personally found extremely encouraging, um, the board of trustees voted to remove Woodrow Wilson's name from the University School of Public and International Affairs, which had been the Woodrow Wilson School. So the new name is the, the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. And um, I wanna read you 
I'm Glenn, I have my eyes on my time. I want to read you part of the report that came from the university. Uh, if the question before us were how to weigh Wilson's achievements against his failures, members of the Princeton community might reach varying judgments. We believe, however, that these times present the university with a different question. Identifying a political leader as the namesake for a public policy school inevitably suggests that the honoree is a role model for those who study in the school. We must therefore ask whether it is acceptable for this university school of public affairs to bear the name of a racist, they said the word, a racist who segregated the nation's civil service after it had been integrated for decades. This question has been made more urgent by the recent killings of Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, and Richard Brooks, which have served as tragic reminders of the ongoing need for all of us to stand against racism and for equality and justice. Our commitment to those values must be clear and unequivocal. We believe that the continued use of Wilson's name on a school of public affairs does not reflect those values and thereby impedes the schools and the university's capacity to pursue their missions. And then a little bit later, as our nation wrestles with its history in this moment, it is important, especially at institutions committed to seeking the truth, that we recognize the complexity of historical figures and that we examine the entirety of their impact on the world. Um, that is my uh, 10 minutes. And I have just a teeny bit more. Why the work, the study, the demotion of greats is important. Showing how anti-democratic and white supremacist beliefs permeated national culture and influenced scholarship is of fundamental importance to the mission of fostering diversity, inclusion, and access in scholarship. As Princeton concluded, we need to both recognize the complexity of historical figures and examine the entirety of their impact on the world. Thank you. Thank you, Nell, very much. Uh, so uh, we've had uh, two very general talks, uh, very interesting to me. Um, I think Felix will uh, focus in a little bit on David Hume. Uh, Felix. Thank you. I assume you can all hear me, but um, is that okay? Yeah, great. I can hear you. No, well, thank you, Glenn, um, for this invitation. And um, it's, it's really a, a pleasure and a privilege to join you in this um, seminar, albeit in, in you know, in a context which I don't normally present in statistics or indeed in any type of department pertaining to natural sciences. Um, and so I'm intrigued to see how people from that perspective might be, um, might approach these issues. Um, I'm mindful that uh, many of the things I had prepared to say were slightly duplicative or reiterative of what Dana and Nell had, had already said so eloquently. And I will try and focus bit more restrictively on the case of David Hume and particularly the, um, the act of dememorialization which occurred in September of 2020 when the University of Edinburgh removed Hume's name from a large tower on George Square um, which had been built in 1963. So Hume's name had attached itself to this tower only since 1963 and was removed in September 2020. Um, I don't think I need to introduce Hume uh, in any great detail, um, but perhaps one thing I will emphasize is his association with the University of Edinburgh, the nature of it, um, and perhaps the appropriateness of the act of memorialization which had occurred in that particular space. Um, Hume attended the University of Edinburgh at a very young age, um, indeed before he was even a teenager. Um, there's not very much evidence of what he studied there, um, it may interest you that there's a manuscript presently in Japan 
uh, which has been attributed to Hume of at least 100 pages on fluxions or infinitesimal calculus. Um, but beyond that, um, we don't really know what he studied. And he left the university um, probably um, after only three years and later had virtually no association with it whatsoever. In fact, in 1745, he applied for a professorship there and was turned down on the basis of his religious heterodoxy. Um, thereafter, he resided in Edinburgh at different junctures in his life, but he didn't teach in the university. And as far as we can tell, he took not a great deal of interest in its activities. Um, Hume was an understandably controversial figure in his lifetime on the basis of his religious views. Um, and in the 19th century, he didn't enjoy um, really much acclaim until um, really later in the century, when I think in the context of an increasingly secular society, he became more celebrated for the views for which he was previously um, condemned. And I think this more or less explains the context in which the university in the 1960s felt it was appropriate to honor Hume in this way. He became associated intimately with what was becoming known as the Scottish Enlightenment, as one of a small number of luminaries, together with Adam Smith, who um, presided over this intellectual movement. Um, in June of 2020, a student at the University of Edinburgh launched an online petition calling for the university to remove Hume's name from the tower. Um, and the student drew attention to a statement in an essay of 1753. The statement is printed as a footnote, a rather long footnote, about a page in octavo. Um, in this essay, and it describes the inferiority, the intellectual inferiority of the Negro, these are Hume's words, and um, it was reprinted in every edition in Hume's lifetime and every edition thereafter, um, and the student reasoned that this was a basis, a sound basis for the removal of Hume's name from a building. It was discordant with the values that the university professed to celebrate. The petition was launched shortly after a statue to a slave trader and philanthropist, Edward Colston, uh, was removed by a crowd in Bristol in, in England. Um, and it was part of a, a similar movement in the United Kingdom to that of the BLM movement in the United St States, revisiting memorialization of certain figures associated particularly with racism or transatlantic slavery. My own role, very, I think, attenuated role in this was to write an editorial in the national newspaper, The Scotsman, um, drawing attention to a discovery I'd made in, of all places, Princeton when I was a graduate student there about a decade ago um, of a letter in Hume's handwriting um, of 1766 addressed to Hume's patron, a man named Lord Hartford, encouraging Hartford to invest in a number of slave plantations in Granada. Um, this was the only excellent evidence of Hume's involvement in the slave trade um, until I found it. And it made sense of two isolated items of evidence which were otherwise known, but until then inexplicable. One, a letter from the governor of Martinique to Hume, commending him for his help in organizing an unidentified transaction, what we now know to be the purchasing of a plantation. And another item, um, involving a loan that Hume advanced to a friend in his bank passbook. My editorial drew attention to these documents um, and it plainly stated that Hume was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. And it also expressed my own opinion that it would be appropriate to remove Hume's name from the tower. Um, in response to this editorial in June, I received a, a a barrage of splenetic emails, um, aggressive voicemails, attempts to disable my e email address and inbox by subscribing me to um, spam on multiple occasions, um, letters in the post uh, directed to my employer, um, and a voicemail which I can play for you, but I wouldn't um, because it's so rude and offensive and aggressively anti-Semitic that I think it would offend um, anyone were they to hear it. In any event, um, this was uh, only mild compared to the response that the removal of Hume's name provoked in September when the university announced that it would act upon the petition. Um, as a result, a number of reports appeared in tabloid newspapers in the United Kingdom, 
Um, it was discussed on national television by one of Britain's most prominent journalists. And again, I was exposed to uh, more harassing emails in part because the decision was attributed to my intervention. Um, so if I were to sort of, I suppose, provide a point of view on, on this debate, it might be from the perspective of somebody um, involved, although as, as I mentioned in a very limited fashion with the process of dememorializing um, and the dangers that might be attendant on that involvement. And I just wanted to draw attention to um, two things. The first were the arguments which were offered um, to both, I think, defend the removal of the name um, and um, against the removal of the name. And the second uh, is just, I think, characteristic of politics, particularly in this country, surrounding dememorialization. So th the first point, the arguments I think advanced uh, regarding the removal of the name were very similar to those canvassed by Dana. Um, and I think one that perhaps deserves uh, particular emphasis which is that if a threshold exists for the removal of any name, if there are individuals whom we prepared to remove from buildings, um, everyone I think should be exposed to that level of scrutiny. And if they fall short of the standard, then it's, under, it's I think defensible that their name might be removed. Arguments against the removal I think were offered far more vocally in the printed uh, newspaper, press, and, and on the radio and on television. Um, the first was that, um, as we've heard, it would be a slippery slope, which names wouldn't be eligible for removal. The second, I think, uh, most prominently, and, and from my perspective, most interestingly, was that Hume was a man of his time, that to expect anything more from him would be inappropriate, because racism and uh, profiting from the slave trade was so widespread that um, to criticize Hume for this would be the condescension of posterity or a form of anachronism. Um, another argument um, which was also quite prominent and perhaps quite particular to this case was that it was just a footnote. This is a, a minor caution or a minor um, digression from Hume's philosophy, it has virtually no significance in that respect, and we cannot hold it against Hume for something that which he wrote en passant, you know, without much thought. Um, I think it might be best if we discuss those arguments in the question time rather than I answer them um, in any itemized way, because I want to just end by talking about the political context of dememorialization in this country in particular. It's clear from those who follow, I think, the newspaper uh, press and Twitter and so on um, in the United Kingdom that the conservative wing of this country is attempting to use de demoralization as a distraction, I think, from deeper political issues. They're attempting, I think, to elicit a culture war focused particularly on this question. And the responses elicited by the removal of Hume's name, the vicious responses, many of them quite incoherent, sent to my email address, um, left on my personal and unlisted phone number, um, I think a character characteristic of the dangerous atmosphere which is growing around this issue in a country um, which I think many professional historians believe in this has been extremely inattentive to precisely what um, Nell was talking about, um, its own past, coming to terms with it, coming to terms with its involvement in the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade, coming to terms with its involvement in the memorialization, and I think importantly, the veneration of figures who had extraordinarily objectionable views, even in their own lifetimes. And that's the very important point I want to end on about Hume. Hume was, inordinately attentive to everything he published, to the extent that he corresponded with his printer almost to his dying day about the placement of punctuation in his writings. The idea that a footnote might have escaped his attention, particularly a footnote that was an entire page in length, is unbelievable. More importantly, the idea that Hume was incapable of thinking beyond the prejudices of his time or escaping them is I think equally unthinkable. And it's very important to remember, and this is the type of sensitivity that I think an historian can bring to this discussion, that the type of racism Hume was engaged in 
the endorsement in, and indeed the profiteering from the slave trade by the middle of the 18th century had attracted an extraordinary amount of criticism. And in, indeed within two or three decades will be the subject of one of the most significant political debates this country had ever seen. Um, the idea that Hume is a man of his time in that respect, I think is demonstrably false. Um, I'll leave it there because I'm, I'm mindful of the amount of time I've gone and I'll, I'll um, look forward to, to discussing this in the question period. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, now we have uh, three very interesting presentations that I hope we could return to. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. And uh, I want to move on to uh, Prakash uh, and what he can tell us about Fisher and others. Yeah, uh, thank you everybody from, uh, for being here. As I was uh, uh, going to say thank you, I just saw a brief email from uh, AWF Edwards to me. Uh, I don't know what he's going to tell me. I'm going to read <laughs> it up, but I'm sure it must be something uh, really terrific. And I'm, uh, I thank Felix very much for what he has, he has said. And, uh, you know, incidentally, very much of what I'm going to, to say will be a bit of a follow up to what he has said and in the context of uh, Fisher. So basically my aim here is to give a context of uh, the dememorialization of, of Fisher. Uh, go over for, for, um, for some of the reasons that are usually uh, given against Demoralization, and uh, finally, I'm going to list some very brief arguments for and against uh, demoralization. And I'll leave it to you guys uh, to uh, discuss about it. But in the course of uh, my presentation, uh, I'm sure you will see where my thoughts are. Uh, will I be able to show some slides? Uh? Yes, yes. You guys can see it? Uh, no. uh, um, share, share now. now. Yes. All right. So Fisher and uh, eugenics. Basically, the, the context of um, Fisher's thought on the matter originated from none other than uh, Gordon, who was the cousin of, uh, of uh, Darwin, as we know. All of these uh, later statisticians, uh, Pearson, uh, um, you have uh, Yule, Pearson, you have uh, Fisher. Uh, all of them basically belong to the uh, eugenics movement. Not only them, there were other geneticists who believe, who belong to that uh, movement, the eugenics uh, uh, movement created uh, in large part by Francis Galton himself. So Galton's eugenic manifesto was stated very early, as early as 1865. I'm going to read here, the power of man over animal life in producing whatever varieties of form he pleases is enormously great. It would seem as though the physical structure of future generations was almost as plastic as clay under the control of a breeder's will. It is my desire to show more pointedly than as far as I'm aware that there has, be, has been attempted before that mental qualities are equally under control. So Gordon's focus was on, the, on mental qualities. What, Fisher, what uh, Darwin had argued for with natural selection, um, Gordon wanted to do with artificial selection by men control. Can we uh, you know, improve the human breed, the human stock? through its mental qualities. And it's very interesting to go into the history and try to find out why Gordon was so concerned about, concerned about more, uh, mental qualities. Remember both Gordon's and uh, Darwin's uh, grandfather was Dr. Erasmus Darwin, very well known, very famous. And uh, Gordon's mother was always telling Gordon about what sort of uh, great man his grandfather was, Dr. Erasmus Darwin. <laughs> And uh, this had tremendous impact on, on Gordon. Gordon was very well off, just like Darwin was. And, uh, you know, at that time in Victorian Britain, there was this, uh, uh, this um, 
urge to give all kinds of amenities to the poor, to the underprivileged, and uh, Gordon so maybe was a bit reticent to give up all his um, all the uh, 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 facilities he was enjoying. All of these can be traced to his belief in the ability of mental ability of uh, of uh, ability of uh, mental capacities to be transmitted. And uh, uh, <clears throat> some people have said, let me now come to the arguments about, you know, some people have said, you know, Galton, Fisher, they were primary concern and, and Pearson, they were primary concern with positive eugenics, meaning let's improve, let's, let's focus on improving of a stock. You know, it's, it's pretty, a lot of arguments have said, you know, they were pretty mild, not so. Look at what exactly Galton said in his 1904 paper. A considerable list of qualities can be easily compiled. They would have more of those qualities that are needed in the state, more vigor, more ability, and more consistency of purpose. The community might be trusted to refuse representatives of criminals and of others whom it rates as undesirable. So here we have a start of negative eugenics. You know, as soon as we start thinking about, you know, how can we improve? We we dichotomize the population about, oh, these are people with good qualities and automatically these are people with undesirable qualities. Who is going to make that judgment? So we are on a slippery slope here, guys. Some people have said, you know, as uh, Felix has very well said, you know, these uh, statisticians, these scientists were products of their times. You know, everybody was like that. So why should we bother on, on the blaming them? Well, they were not products of their times. A lot of, a lot of uh, scientists were aware of these problems, of, of a problem of racial, racial equality and all that. These were discussed since the times of, of, uh, Plato, of uh, Plato and Aristotle, the question of ethics of morality. Darwin himself was very much opposed to his cousin. He had a big fight on the ship uh, that, um, uh, for which, uh, uh, he did his uh, world tour. He had a big fight with a uh, with, uh, uh, person in charge there about, uh, about uh, um, <clears throat> race, races, about slavery and all of that. And Darwin said, the aid we wish we feel impelled to give to the helpless is mainly an incidental result of a stick of sympathy. If we were to intentionally neglect the weak and the helpless, it could only be for a contingent benefit with a certain and great present evil. These scientists were not a product of their times. People were aware of the dangers of eugenics, of race, of slavery, well out before their times. They were not. And of course, a lot of people after Garton took upon his, uh, his uh, 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 eugenics belief. One of them is the well-known H.G. Wells, who called for the sterilization of failure. And we know what happened afterwards, you know, no need to repeat that. The UNESCO statement, uh, because of a mounting, you know, the Second World War had happened, all of this has happened. The UNESCO under the leadership of several geneticists and scientists, they made clear, a clear statement on race based on science. In matters of race, the only characteristics which anthropologists have so far been able to use effectively as a basis of classification of physical, anatomical, and physiological. Available scientific knowledge provides no basis for believing that the groups of mankind differ in their innate capacity for intellectual and emotional development. Some biological differences between human beings within a single race may be as great as or greater than the same differences between races. There are more differences within races than between races. We are still, I still teach that when I teach population genetics. But Fisher, some people have said, you know, Fisher was very mild. It was very mild, the stuff he said, there's nothing major. His, uh, his uh, 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 statements on race are very, very moderate, you know, nothing to be uh, worried about. Well, let's read what he actually said. Sir Fisher, Ronald Fisher had one fundamental objection to the statement. 
He believes that human groups differ profoundly in their innate capacity for intellectual and emotional development and concludes from this that the practical international problem is that of learning to share the resources of this planet amicably with persons of materially different nature. We all know what this means and what this is heading, you know? So we should think very well, uh, very uh, carefully when we say that Fisher, you know, wasn't, you know, was a very mild on, on racial terms. He was a great statistician, there's no doubt about that. But at the, at the same time, you know, much, there's much to be desired. Uh, let's read his letter, 1948, to Wesley, the Dean of a Medical Faculty at Frankfurt University, in support of a von Verschuer, a Nazi supporting medical geneticists. In spite of her prejudices, I have no doubt that the Nazi party wished to benefit the German racial stock especially by the elimination of manifest defectives such as those deficient mentally. And I do not doubt that von Virchow gave, as I should have done, his support to such a movement. It, I won't say much about it. So, you know, uh, as it happened, you know, with the uh, jo killing of George Floyd, there was an increase concession concessionist about matters of race, uh, and uh, we have a statement from the COPSS uh, for retiring. There's pros and cons. I've read a very good paper against the memorialization, though I don't agree very much with it. How am I going with for time, uh, Glenn? I can't, I can't hear you, sorry. Maybe one more minute. One more minute. So scientists are products of their times. Denaming is against freedom of speech. Denaming is a product of victimhood culture. Arguments for a stand against perceived prejudice and bigotry, a more inclusive and welcoming environment for the community. I'll leave you guys to debate upon this, but I hope uh, my own view, my own two cents on the issue were pretty clear. With that, <laughs> okay. I leave the panel. Okay, well, we have some time. Thank you very much, uh, Prakash. Um, and I, I really want to return to uh, discussing with you uh, how um, maybe um, uh, how we reconcile removing uh, some honors from Fisher with also giving him such a large role as you in fact have done in uh, your study of his work in uh, statistics and genetics. Uh, but we uh, still have John uh, uh, to talk to us about some of the other uh, dememorialization of uh, Fisher, I think. Uh, John, it's all yours. Okay, right. Uh, because I can't speak in paragraphs, I've been some slides, um, having trouble opening them. Are they the same slides uh, that you sent me earlier, John? Yeah, they, they are. Can you do? Can you help then? Uh, I could uh, share them. I think. Um... Okay, that's fine. Right, tell me when okay. you want to advance them. Right. So, uh, so I want to talk about Fisher. Um, basically, what I've done is just to report what's been happening with Fisher in the last year or so, but also looking back to the process by which he was honored. So that, that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, next slide, please, Glenn. Uh, here's a bit from the uh, newspaper, The Guardian, uh, reporting the removal of the window. Uh, the window is on the left, it is the Latin square cover from his book, The Design of Experiments. Above it is a Venn diagram celebrating John Venn. 
is also a fellow of Keith College. Uh, so th that's 2020. Uh, Glenn, next slide. In, in 1987, the window was installed. Uh, I say it sent a message, made a statement. Of course, all these messages and statements are in a sense fictions because a window was installed. Some of the people in the college thought they were installing it for one reason. Other people in the college thought they were uh, celebrating for another. But my impression is what we're doing is we, the people, we, Keys College, are celebrating our people because they're our fellows who made big contributions. They weren't celebrating Fisher as a eugenicist, but as a statistician. What was the point of celebrating them? Well, possibly to thank them for their contribution to knowledge, perhaps to inspire us. This was in the dining hall at Keys College, the windows. So while we eat, we absorb uh, their spirit. Uh, something which Keys wouldn't have said, but which is a cynical outsider, I believe. Keys was blowing his own trumpet to the world because Fisher was more famous than Keys and the association uh, flattered Keys and raised their profile. So that was in 1987, that was the message. We're celebrating basically good work by our people. In 2020, next, thanks Glenn. Uh, I think the message is twofold. We're demonstrating our college's openness to all kinds of people all kinds, whatever race, uh, whatever social background. We're making a statement, we're making a stand against racism. Uh, Barakash has actually described how Fisher didn't believe that men were created equal, how he advocated eugenics and had views about racial intermarriage. Why we refuse him? Well, because it's because it always installing and deinstalling was always to satisfy the Keys community. I think in 1920, in 2020, the Keys community, the we who do these things, had changed. Back in 87, it was the fellows, it was the, the, the elite of the college. Uh, in 2020, it was the students as well, as well. So why, so to satisfy the Keys community, again, to show the world, but showing them something different, showing them that Keys was uh, sensitive to, to, to. Okay, so the window is just one of his honors. Uh, Nell and uh, Dana have talked about memorialization. I actually think of these memorials as being related to honors in people's lifetime as well. So, uh, so obviously memorializing people in the past is different because they're from the past. In the, so po posthumous celebratory artifacts, the window, a statue, a picture, celebratory artifacts, they don't have any purpose uh, except to celebrate the people. Uh, uh, another kind of memorial are useful things things that have uses to which the person's name is attached. And in Fisher's case, buildings, institutes, uh, prizes, and so on. Uh, so they're, they're the posthumous commemor commemorations. In his lifetime, he, he got buckets of distinctions. I'll, I'll talk about two in more detail, FRS, knighthood. He also got medals from societies. He also got honorary degrees and he got the full range of honors that a scientist of his time could have. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, okay. I think for, uh, for Fisher, the two big honors were being made a fellow of the Royal Society at our National Academy. Uh, that has a citation and he's, Citation is for original contributions to theory of stats and applications. Uh, no mention of eugenics there. And then in 1952, 
I say he, he was knighted for services to science. I don't think there actually was a citation. At that time, he was a professor at Cambridge, top of his profession. Uh, so I've written services to science. Again, he is not commemorated for eugenic, but sorry, not honored for eugenics, just honored for, for other things. Uh, de uh, sorry, Glenn, yeah, you're right. Next one, dehonoring. Okay, dehonoring. Uh, Fisher wasn't dehonored de -honored by the Royal Society or the British state because they seem only to dehonor the living. They honor the living and they dehonor the living. Royal Society, I've only spent a bit of time with Wikipedia. I haven't noticed any regulations. I noticed any instances of expulsion. Uh, given that they uh, admit people to the society, because of their scientific achievement, and an obvious cause. I've never, I haven't found any cases of this, but it does seem to be an obvious cause, is when the original contributions are not. They're plagiarism or falsification. Uh, people do plagiarize, people do falsify results, but I, I, I haven't seen any examples of Royal Society people being expelled for such. National honors are different. They're occasionally withdrawn. So somebody who's a knight or somebody who's received an honor of some kind, if that person's found unfit, discovered to be unfit, uh, or, or regarded as dishonoring the honor, uh, then if there's a big public outcry, they may go. So there are cases like this. Wikipedia has lists of them. Uh, so basically, if for example, I was made a knight, and then for, for my services to scholarship. And then it was discovered that I was a child abuser and I was sent to jail for it. I'd lose the knighthood. But usually it follows a big public campaign. It's, it's fairly uncommon. It doesn't happen to dead people. Although some people think it should happen, but it doesn't. Yeah. Next slide, Ken. So looking back on all these things, Fisher is subject to changing criteria, changing arbiters. In the honoring of Royal Society, knighthood, window, what counted was his scientific achievement. As, and the people who did the arbitration were scientific national college elites. In the de-honoring of 2020, what counted most was his position on racism. The people who made this judgment were the college authorities, because I'm talking about the window, the college authorities, but they were pressed by, I call it public opinion, but of course it's called it college opinion. Um, they're also possibly general public opinion. So that, that's all I want to say about Fisher. Thank you, Ben. That's the end of my bit. Well, thank you very much. So uh, I want to thank all of our uh, panelists. Uh, uh, very interesting. Um, uh, let's see, I need to keep track of the chat. Uh, if someone um, uh, um, uh, it looks like Harry has turned off the recording. Is that right, Harry? It seems to no, be but, uh, Do you want me to? No, I thought somehow I saw a notice here that seemed to indicate that you had. No, it's still it's still going. I see. Well, we can leave it on. Uh, up to you. I uh, think I think it would be good. I mean, the discussion I think could be interesting. So that okay, but, yeah. okay, excellent. Uh, well, um, I uh, I should have been monitoring. Uh, excuse me. I should have been monitoring the um, uh, chat. Uh, I don't think we've had uh, too many questions there. Or if someone wants to unmute and speak, we have about uh, uh, 20 seconds here, but I don't think we'll end up talking over each other. Uh, I'll begin, though, with uh, one question, and that is, as I mentioned, as I hinted already to Prakash Gorich, uh, who has written a big book on the history of statistics with a big emphasis on Fisher, I'm sure he has full page pictures, at least one full page picture of Fisher there. And I think most people would consider this 
uh, book to show a lot of honor towards Fisher. Uh, and um, I'd, I'd like to ask him how he distinguishes between that type of honoring and, uh, or whether he would distinguish between that type of honoring and naming something after Fisher. Uh, as you will see in my book, uh, 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 Glenn, I do talk about uh, a lot of uh, great works that Fisher did from the invention of uh, likelihood to the, you know, handing down the vocabulary of statistics that is used today. But also you'll see that in the book, I also mention a lot of his shortcomings, his temper, his uh, inability to adapt to certain situations, inability to uh, accept he was wrong on the fidu fiducial part. What I'm trying to say is that there's nothing that prevents me from saying, you know, Fisher was a great statistician, but he was completely wrong in his, uh, in his emphasis on race and racial superiority on, on, on uh, on uh, these issues, he was completely wrong. But at the same time, he was a great st statistician, he was great, but he had some, uh, you know, major shortcomings. They, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, a human being can have both good qualities and very bad ones. If you go to the presidential library of Bill Clinton, you'll, uh, you'll surely read about some of the great economic work he did, but also you will uh, also read about Monica Lewinsky too. Okay. Uh, I see a hand by from Nell. Yeah. Um, when I was thinking about talking to you all, I was thinking about not just dealing with the men, uh, honoring and unhonoring men, but also uh, about the chance that this gives to honor new and different people. Because we know that there are built-in um, advantages and disadvantages to notably uh, women, but also people of color or people from uh, not wealthy backgrounds. It's not an accident that the people we're talking about came from wealthy families. So there, there are lots of other people in the world of scholarship and by opening up some spaces uh, from the former greats, I think it would be great, if, it would be wonderful if we took the next steps and see the people who had not been visible before. Len, you're muted. Len, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just thanked Nell and asked if someone else would like to pose a question. Uh, this is Paul. Um, <clears throat> I don't quite know how to formulate this question. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., where every intersection of avenues is marked by an equestrian statue. Um, and when we were kids, we knew very well that the only, the only creatures who paid any attention to the statues were the pigeons. But they existed for whatever they might be able to teach us. <clears throat> if, if it is necessarily true that history is a continually changing painting of the past, perhaps what we should do is not take down, but uh, decorate or annotate or elaborate so that the statue could be wearing a sign around its neck that says in 2020, uh, this man was judged X or Y. Uh, and to have another one added 40 years later when people feel that we were quite wrong in something that we, we decided. Some of that happened uh, during last summer when the, the gigantic, um, uh, was it in Washington? Was it in Alexandria? Was it in Charlottesville? No, uh, gigantic Robert Lee Lee statue that was just too big for people to take down. So they started 
painting it and projecting art on it. So it became a different kind of artwork. But I think that's not enough. I think those people need to come down. Uh, what if they are people like Fisher for whom his eugenics has never been what we praised, why we praised him? <laughs> well, I'm not in your field, but I say take him down too. <laughs> and can we come to a, a mutual, uh, a sort of midway between, uh, you know, uh, Fisher was a great uh, scientist, a, in terms of his stats, but he had this. Could we, uh, I, I was thinking of this, of a sort of uh, 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 midway uh, solution. You know, have the statue, but increase uh, in, in the context, change the context. Say, you know, Fisher was great uh, for his statistical work, but you know, give a proper context of Fisher and say, you know, he also had some, you know, beliefs that were blah, 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 you know, keep the statue, but uh, change the, the description, basically, to give a full context of a person. That would be something that I imagine, you know, because I still think uh, Fisher was a great uh, statistician, but I recognize there were some very bad issues associated with him. So when I would uh, see, look at his statue, yes, great statistician, but, you know. I don't know if we had any statues of him. We had this oh, lecture named know. after him. Uh, we had this window. I don't know how I would add that to the lecture. Uh, I do have another question I would like to raise. And then- Felix told us something about why people started honoring Hume after a period when he wasn't much honored. Uh, he represented a certain thing. And uh, I would like, it seems to, to me that Fisher, these things, this lecture, and I, or these lectures, because there's, I think, other, another lecture that has not been, where his name has not been removed. Uh, so I think these different lectures were named after him by people who were making a point about not just how important Fisher was, but how uh, uh, the ideas he presented in the early 20th century were important. And therefore, the departments of statistics and the way they're defined in ang the Anglo-Saxon world, and maybe not everywhere else, that's important. And now we're facing, um, you know, we're facing a situation where this centrality of this set of ideas is actually being challenged intellectually, and we're, we're we are being told maybe we should uh, pay more attention to what's come out of computer science, and maybe uh, what we've called statistics should be broadened some, uh, you know, and we should have, we should reshape our curriculum. Uh, how can we, uh, so what do we do if, if we were trying to do that, if we were trying to reshape the, what it is we want to memorialize, do we need to find some, uh, do we need to find more heroes uh, regardless uh, of their personalities? Do we need to find more heroes to do that? Or is there something else we can do? What are our options? Uh, that's a question I'd like to ask to our group. Well, I just like to add um, before I answer, I also see Deborah and Harry's hand up as well. So I'll try to go quickly so they have a space to ask their questions. That one thing that I might have added a binary that I want to be careful in stepping back from, that although I was talking about memorializing and dememorializing, there are still other elements. It's not a black or white picture. There are modes of amendment. There are ways in which we can engage with monuments to transform them, play with them. Um, there's great work being done by the Monument Lab in Philadelphia or paper monument, monuments in New Orleans, just on this question of how do you deal with monuments that don't warrant removal, but need added contextualization? Um, so Prakash, exactly what you were doing in the book, like there are definitely accomplishments here that we need to um, highlight, 
there's also some problematic areas that equally deserve attention. And so if you're looking at revisiting a syllabus or really how do I engage with undergraduates or graduates and deal with the complexity of the issue, I think it's very easy to do so once you don't go away from that picture. Like once you realize that people are complex and that if we pull up their balance sheet of good and bad, it might be uneven, but we can still deal with that. Um, so when I teach Emmanuel Kant, for instance, um, in Kaliningrad, Russia, which was formerly Konigsberg, um, Prussia, where Kant taught, there is a huge row four years ago where people, Russians, wanted the statue removed. It was for anti-German reasons. It wasn't due to his philosophy. It wasn't due to his intellectual contributions. But if you actually look at his work in philosophy, a lot of people argue, well, for the categorical imperative, for deontology, Kant is worthy of study and worthy of honor and canonization. But what is done at times is that you remove all the gray areas or the morally dark areas. You forget that Kant taught over 30 years um, in Konigsberg, a work on geography and a course on anthropology. So he's teaching a course 30 years plus about the deficiency of other races. And so once you bring in that picture and saying, well, maybe some of his work in anthropology actually did influence his moral theory, or maybe it didn't, but at least we're asking that question and we're trying to answer it rather than saying it has no relevance. Um, and I think that's what a lot of students, a lot of people are wanting now, that if we actually have complex figures, public figures, scholars, deal with the full history and let us, or let the individual make a decision about where that person stands if they are worthy of honor. So I'll just add that. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Deborah, uh, you did have had your hand up. I'm sorry. You're muted. Okay, you hear me? Um, yes, very interesting uh, comments. Um, one of the concerns I have is the bias that um, can uh, result in the unmemorializing, uh, dememorializing people, just as there was bias in deciding who to memorialize, uh, the groups um, at any period in time will be. Um, and it seems to me that we would need to have a group or set of groups that thoroughly research the full contributions, abuses, and sins and whatever of an individual in order for everyone to feel that this was a fair process. So for example, um, we don't look at de dememorializing men who have been abusive uh, to women who have written books on, on their intellectual inferiority. And it isn't even just, um, well, they're men of their time. This is the current time <laughs> that they still have these attitudes. And when I see that not being looked at, it, I think it creates a problem for um, considering uh, the entire process as um, fair. Uh, I also think that the, my second uh, concern is about um, a kind of slippery slope and going too far uh, because um, I see, just the other day that now Lincoln high schools are going to, you know, they strip the name Lincoln. And then I saw one of my favorite poet, Robert Louis Stevenson was taken away his name from a high school because he wrote one very silly little poem among millions of wonderful poems in his children's um, garden verses where he talked about uh, really from a child's point of view uh, to a foreign child. Don't you wish you were like me? But I think that it, again, it was the perspective of a child. So I, these two concerns about um, that we have not, in some cases they did do research. I think in, at UCL for about a year, they looked into Pearson, but by and large, uh, we don't see a full gamut of somebody's life and contributions being looked at and and then the slippery slope issue. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, uh, I think Harry may have been the, uh, had his hand up quite a while. 
Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks to the, the speakers and the panelists. I think that was uh, informative. And I think to follow up on Deborah's last point, uh, having a, I guess by now we've had plenty of time to to think about it and to research it. And that certainly wasn't the case at the time that the uh, statistical societies made their decisions. And I think that to some extent that would be the least that we could have asked for. And so I do appreciate uh, that, that um, you know, the effort and the, um, the discussion there. Uh, regardless of what the right decision may have been now, I do think that it's, it's correct to um, give it the proper uh, discussion that it deserves. Uh, to, to follow up on what Paul had said, and, and Dana had, had mentioned some things about amendments, and I, I just I should mention, at least for my part on this, I, I was part of a group that had written something uh, in response to Fisher, and our suggestion was to uh, amend the uh, description of his lecture to acknowledge that the lecture was for his achievements and not for his personal beliefs, and to also acknowledge what some of the faults of those beliefs may have been. The reason for that was twofold, and I'm curious what the panelists uh, might think, which is uh, the first was a concern, and I think this is a concern that we should all have as people who are in, whether it's in academia or in society, which is the, uh, well, first of all, the mixing of politics and science. Fisher was a scientist. He was, he was being memorialized for his science, not for his personal beliefs. And if we're to bring, and to what extent are we corrupting the science when we bring politics into it? It's understandable that there are societal issues, but where, where is the line drawn? And I think that that's uh, one of the things that I didn't see in the, in the panel discussion, and I'm curious what the panelists would think of this, is I saw a lot of discussion of Fisher's faults or Hume's faults or the, the reasons for dememorializing somebody. I did not see much discussion of the reasons for memorializing them in the first place, but I would say that it certainly seems that the reason for memorializing is not the same as the reason for dememorializing. They're two different discussions, which I think gets to the po political or the societal versus the scientific. And so I'm, I'm just curious if there's any thoughts on that. Uh, so uh, maybe Aditya has had his hand up. So uh, maybe we could return and I could ask the panel to think about your question after Aditya uh, makes his comment. Uh, yeah, so I, let me try to be quick so that people can remember the thread of Deborah's, Harry's, and my questions. Um, I, I wanted to raise the role uh, of uh, two separate roles, one of money and one of uh, the recipient. Uh, so what is money? Like, uh, well, I, I guess every school these days um, has some building named after someone who donated a lot of money. There's a Gates uh, Building of Computer Science at CMU, and there's a. I'm in the Dietrich College of Humanity and Social Sciences. So it seems that uh, you can get your name attached to buildings not only because you did something uh, intellectually relevant to, to the building, but also because you gave a lot of money. And I think in those situations, uh, uh, I, I wonder, you know, uh, can, you know, are, are later generations or future students allowed to be like, wait a minute, I, I know they gave money when the building was built, but, you know, can we remove their name off the building and so on? So I just wanted to know people's thoughts on, uh, can people memorialize themselves <laughs> by giving a lot of money? I find that uh, really odd on a university when it does happen, uh, but it does all the time. Nice. And so that was, there was money. And the other one was on the recipient, which is a lot of these things are named lectures, for example, the Fisher lecture. Um, even if the ASA or whoever had decided not to rename the Fisher Lecture, um, you can also imagine the case where the recipient of the, uh, of the lecturership does not want to be associated with Fisher. Meaning the, uh, so it would be a little bit weird if they have to, uh, if the lecturership went, uh, Fisher was a great statistician and then but dot dot dot, and then the person who's giving the lecture has to start their lecture by distancing themselves from Fisher or, or at least a large part of Fisher's opinions. So how, you know, um, 
how do we address that part of it that many people today maybe maybe from the younger generation or may, maybe many others even from the older generations they don't want to be associated with fisher and they want the award they want the lecture but they don't want to be associated with fisher they don't want an article put out by the sa saying this year's fisher lecturer is x and they will be like no no i don't want my name and fisher in the same sentence i mean if they had their opinion how do we handle that complex uh, situation so the recipient and money were my questions Okay, can uh, can we ask our panelists to um, have their to offer thoughts on these questions? Uh, uh, let me see. Aditya was was recipient in money. Uh, Deborah was. Uh, uh, see, it is hard to remember. Deborah was. Um, uh, time to. A thorough review of the goods and bags. Thorough day. review, and uh, Harry was talking about uh, time to look at things. I think, yeah. Well, more importantly, separating, you know, the societal issues from scientific no. issues okay. and scientific achievement. Okay. Okay. If I may so. briefly respond, I, I would totally agree with Deborah's suggestion. If you look at the Fisher's case, the whole thing happened within the span of 20 days. From the time the first tweet was sent or an email was sent by uh, uh, Dr. Witt, and then very, within 20 days, the Fisher award was taken off. So we need to really have a panel, you know, to, to discuss these issues and at, at least uh, discuss them thoroughly. There was no back and forth, uh, no, you know, papers published on that and the decision was made very quick. I wanted to very quickly to, I think what Harry Kane has said, you know, we need to uh, disentangle the personal qualities and the uh, uh, intellectual achievement uh, memorializing was because of intellectual achievement and demoralizing is because of a uh, personal qualities. I would say first eugenics wasn't a personal choice. It was, it was a science in itself. So you see, we demoralizing not because of a personal belief, but because of a way the science was conducted and the assumption under which the science was conducted. And second, I would say it's very hard to gauge the, uh, the intellectual achievement of somebody without uh, uh, having a reference to his personal uh, qualities. It's very hard to distinguish between them two. Can I go back to Pierre Nora for a moment? Um, when he talked about uh, places of memory and memory, he talked about how it seems to be eternal, to be for all time and permanent. And that's the way you're talking about these various kinds of memorials. Um, Felix talked about how recently um, Hume had been put on his pedestal and uh, you know he can come down that nothing is eternal. Uh, Nora talked about the difference between the seeming permanence of memory and the changing uh, nature of how we make history. And I would underline that, that what you're talking about in terms of either memorializing or dememorializing, you're talking about something that is part of a process. Nothing is forever. Do our other panelists have some uh, thoughts on these issues? Uh, Felix? Um, thank you. Uh, um, I suppose I'll try and respond to each of the three points um, that were made in, in those three questions. Um, I suppose the first about separating one's personal morality from their scientific or intellectual achievements. I mean, there has to be a standard by which we hold people accountable. If an individual has been involved in the mass transportation and murder of children, which I think is a credible description of the slave trade, um, in an era in which it was known to be objectionable to murder children, in which they did it on the basis of their racist beliefs, that has to be a barrier to their memorialization, notwithstanding their great genius. Um, there has to be some standard to which we apply for the memorialization of anyone. We obviously wouldn't memorialize a member of the Nazi party. I don't think we would or ought to ever memorialize an individual who aided or abetted knowingly a member of the Nazi party. Um, I can talk about the discussion at Keyes because I was a student at Keyes for a decade. Uh, all of my closest academic colleagues were behind the decision to remove Fisher's name. I mean, it's very important to remember when the 
window was placed there, people were quite aware of Fisher's views among the Fellowship of Keys. And the reason why they were indifferent to them has to do with their own political sympathies, which have changed markedly, as John pointed out, in the intervening decades. Keys has been transformed from what it was then, which was a bastion of Thatcherite conservatism to what it is now, a, a multicultural college headed by a woman, the first female master of Keys uh, since its foundation in, 13, in, in the 14th century. Um, standards do change, but it's very important that we don't fall prey to the type of moral relativism suggested by some of the commentary here, that within a few decades, we might see fit to um, decide that the people we now memorialize aren't worthy of a memorialization because moral standards change. Um, I'm not sure many of you would approve of the sentiment that the moral standard that um, objects to murder or objects to Nazism is going to change sufficiently that we will one day memorialize Fisher again, or indeed Hume. I, I can't see that happening or it ought not to happen. And finally, I mean, when it comes to um, the slippery slope argument, it's obvious that we can't spend all of our time assessing the moral probity of individuals after whom we name or we have named formerly streets and so on. Um, there's also, I think, the argument that there are more important things to do with our time. Um, but that's not really, I think, a meaningful objection to the process of dememorialization, um, particularly where it pertains to conspicuous acts of memorialization, which I think it's very important to emphasize are acts of veneration. The notion that my writing a book about Hume is an act of veneration or devoting my life to studying Hume's thought is an act of veneration is extremely, I think, misconceived. This is an act of reconstructing the past from a perspective that makes us understand the past and incidentally will make us understand the present. It has nothing whatsoever to do with a moral judgment about the individuals I'm studying. And I think that's very important to remember when we decide to name a building, an enormous building, by far the tallest building in Edinburgh after David Hume, it's an act of veneration, not an act merely of memory. Um, and I think that really does play into the point that Aditya made about financial donations. Um, probably the vast majority of buildings on campuses are named after donors. Um, they should obviously be subject to the type of revisionism that will attend to questions about whether donors got their money. Um, as I'm sure many of you will know about the most famous recent university donor in the United States, um, who was in the news in the last decade, in the last few years, I should say, Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, there's obvious reasons why that money should either be returned or the names removed. And the same process should play out to any donor who in subsequent generations we discover derive their money from objectionable sources. Um, I think there are moral standards that can apply to all of these questions and they're quite obvious. I don't think they're too questionable. Uh, let's see, did uh, um, our other panelists uh, want to add anything to these points? Uh... I did have a Paul, uh, I did have a point, Glenn, but I think Lawrence Paul had his hand up. Or uh, Paul. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, let's, let me, Dana, let me call on you because we were asking our panelists to respond before we get to Paul. Okay, so I'll try to be quick because um, I love taking questions and hearing from everyone. Um, and I'll do a similar process to Felix, try to hit on each point, but I'll begin with Aditya. Um, when we're talking about monuments and the fact that in university settings, vast buildings and halls have donated names um, or donated memorials, the same is true of actually of public monuments. Um, most monuments are either privately funded or donated, um, at least in the United States. And the issue becomes whether you're looking at the National Daughters of the Confederacy that made most Confederate monuments in the US in the 1910s and 1960s, again, way past the Civil War, um, is that they're not democratic processes. This is not crowds funding. Um, individuals with wealth and money are choosing to donate monuments or their name for public um, public acts or public figures. So I just wanted to state clearly like, yeah, the, the complete process is unfair. Um, it's not democratic. It's not going through a selective process of our, why are we naming it? Is a person worthy of being having a significant building name? 
it's if you have the money. Um, and so I think that brings up Deborah's concern about is the process fair? Um, and from my studies, the process is never fair. It's selective. Um, it's always a selective process of remembering some elements and highlighting those or venerating and honoring while being reductive in the sense of obliterating some unmentionables or undesirable memories. Um, you can see this most clearly in public figures. So if you talk about George Washington, any of his statues in the United States or at the Washington Monument, since it's the most prominent, um, people will say it's for his presidency, for being the first, um, first general, uh, for helping win the war. A lot of his many accomplishments, even giving up political power, not becoming a king. Um, but within that white marble obelisk, people don't talk about the sullied elements. They don't talk about his war against indigenous people, how it relates to settler colonialism. They don't talk about his um, formerly enslaved um, woman own a judge escaping from him and his wife and him pursuing her until he died. Again, even though you'll hear the common refrain, Washington set his slaves free at his death. Well, for the one who got away, he never again, stop trying to recapture. So when we're talking about even monuments of public figures, celebrated figure, again, George Washington is the most, for many people, is the most celebrated American figure you can have. Even he has some dark elements, depending on what you find salient, depending on what you find selective. So because people have such vast histories, I don't think you're ever going to go through an entire panel and say, okay, out of all this process, the accomplishments outweigh the failures or the negatives. People are still gonna be selective. So for indigenous people and black people in the United States, they might, again, weigh as more salient those negative aspects. Even for George Washington, even for Christopher Columbus, even for Abraham Lincoln, who again, presided over the largest mass hanging of indigenous people, actually the largest mass hanging in US history, or was for the American Colonization Society. So returning Africans back to Africa instead of having them be citizens. Um, so again, for me, when I look at history and I see it, there is bias, there is unfairness. That's throughout time. It's not just a recent phenomenon. So I'm fine with the selectiveness and I know there's gonna be misfires, but I like the messiness of history. Like if you're gonna play <laughs> with history, uh, I think you need to get down and dirty. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I completely see the reason why people, and this is Harry's, um, part of Harry's question, when someone has such a scientific accomplishment, but we also want to divorce them from like personal societal issues, but in the act of memorializing, they all get blended in. Um, it's not just, you can't just remember one thing in a person's life. Um, people will always bring up those other elements, unfair or fair. It's just a common practice. So again, I know that's longer, um, but that's what I wanted to add. So thank you, Glenn. Okay, thank you, Dana. Uh, uh, Paul, you wanted to uh, add something? Just a comment in support of what Felix said that uh, about moral relativism. And this is, I guess, uh, maybe I'm at odds with Prakash. Um, there's got to be a limit, doesn't there? I mean, uh, I'm not sure Fisher exceeded the limit, but he certainly came close. I mean, if he were a mass murderer or a child molester, I don't care how great his statistical accomplishments were, I don't think we could separate it. It's, it's not possible for one brain to separate those two elements after a certain point. So I don't think it's possible in general, Prakash, to say that one could simply honor someone's scientific accomplishments and ignore, you know, blemishes or, 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 or especially major problems. You know, one person we haven't talked about here is Carl Pearson, who I think is sort of low fruit, much lower fruit than, than Fizz in a way, because those articles he published in, 19, in the 20s, 1925, with, with Margaret Mole about Jewish immigrants to Britain were completely unscientific, were called out at the time, and yet Pearson, you know, is, is a great recipient of many honors. So in a way, it's a simpler case that we're just not pursuing, it seems to me. Thanks. Well, let me uh, try to clarify something. Uh, Felix here, both Felix and, um, uh, and Prakash have spent an immense amount of time studying the figures we're talking about. So, 
uh, somehow the title that I propose for the panel, Worthy of Study, Worthy of Honor, uh, I take it that from both Felix and Prakash's point of view, those are two different things. Uh, yes, uh, Fischer was an immense, uh, one of the greatest statisticians, if not the greatest statistician who created the statistical vocabulary, as I clearly explain in my book. But at the same time, he had some misguided views. But, but Prakash, take a second here, uh, and you're the expert for, for certain, but if you look at the, his, his full letters collection, which I'm sure you, you, know, you know much better than I do, like at Adelaide, Adelaide um, the way he treated so many other statisticians, and of course, including Neyman and Pearson, uh, the, the disdain with which he treated you know, so many people, for me at least, somewhat subtracts from his scientific accomplishments because we're talking about in the field of statistics, not just in eugenics, in the field of statistics, he was, you know, he was very troublesome and not in any way a supportive figure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he had issues with almost everybody. If you, you could write a big book about all the fights he had with almost everybody. He was completely intolerant of uh, dissension, okay? Uh, ne ne he called Neyman a malicious mischief maker and uh, Neyman called him a manipulative statistician. So the words uh, do not, but uh, that would be his personal uh, belief. But in terms of his creation of what he has created, Lawrence, in terms of, sorry, Paul, in terms of what he created, the concepts came about, the proofs he gave, that was truly am amazing. And I admire that part. But in terms of his dealings with others, his uh, tolerance of others, that was deplorable. And everything, I, I explain it to you, those of you who want to read the book, it's a, it has a lot to do with the politics of, uh, of, Fisher, of how he dealt with others. All these uh, spicy details are related in the book. Well, we have a pause here. Uh, let me report um, uh, one comment by uh, Laurent Maziak, who I think has now left us and gone to bed. Uh, but in the chat, he mentioned to me that he disagrees with Nell about Pierre Nora. He thinks Pierre Nora is still living. <laughs> so. No, I don't think so. So we'll have to settle that. Uh, yeah. I'll check. So, um, I mean, he, his name certainly leaves. I don't know about the body. Oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Aditya um, has a question on the chat. Who wants to be recipient of the Fisher Lecture now? I guess we didn't really address that question of Aditya's. Uh, could our uh, do our panelists want to say something about about that? Uh, what, how, how, to what extent? Uh, if we have, and this is a is an interesting point. We in um, in 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 our academic societies, we have lectures named after lots of folks. Uh, and um, Aditya was saying, what if the person wants the honor but not the uh, association? Uh, what is there to say about that? It's certainly a good place. Oh, well, I, I was just going to say that um, I held the David Hume Fellowship at the University of Edinburgh. And a number of people in these emails they wrote to me pointed out that it was hypocritical of me to have taken the fellowship and they anticipated that I would refund the University of Edinburgh the money that they gave me, um, because how could I possibly accept a fellowship in Hume's name? But again, I, I think it's extremely important to emphasize that this was a fellowship devoted to the study of Hume. I think it's fittingly named after him. And that's a distinction between a lecture series named after Hume as an act of veneration. I mean, understandably, these two things are not clear cut. I mean, one will shade into the other. Invariably, someone elected to that fellowship will venerate Hume, um, but I, that wasn't a condition of the fellowship. Um, and 
I, I can sort of see why it might be practicable to accept a fellowship like that without necessarily morally endorsing the um, the figure, particularly if it's devoted to the study of, of the individual themselves. But I mean, you know. Well, Harry, I, um, Harry Crane, Harry Crane has his hand up, but I want to ask Felix another question. I know two people who have undertaken to write biographies of, uh, of scientists, uh, or no, excuse me, who underwritten to, to, to underwritten to write biographies of famous people, uh, with the intention of being very critical of them. Uh, one of them was uh, Nell can help me, a, a a guy who spent his entire career writing about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he was one of my uh, a oh team. right Link, Link Arthur Link, yeah. Yeah. Arthur Link. Uh, Nell yeah. once had dinner with Arthur Link, and uh, it was explained to me. He explained that he had undertaken as a young person to write about Woodrow Wilson with the attitude that he was really going to show Wilson's faults. He was out to get him. Uh, and it didn't turn out that way. By the time he had spent his entire life, you know, studying this guy, he identified with him so much that his biography sounded, you know, didn't have that tone at all. And another person uh, that I think of is um, our uh, historian, um, <clears throat> uh, a contemporary of ours who uh, wrote a biography of uh, Carl Pearson. Uh, and I think in the biography, he says Porter. that uh, Porter. Ted Porter. Porter, Ted Porter, Ted Porter. Yes, Ted Porter. If I recall correctly, in the preface, he says he started out being wanting to write, be very critical of Pearson, but he found him so charming <laughs> that he really got carried away about the positive aspects of his character and life. Uh, and the book comes across that way. So uh, I guess my question to Felix is, how did you escape this? <laughs> How did you avoid falling in love with uh, with uh, David Hume? Uh, I, I think, well, the, the point is that I'd hate to read a biography which uh, was full of moral judgments by its author about the practices of the individual involved. I mean, that's certainly not what I regard as any, I think, credible historian's purpose. It's to report the facts and to leave it to the reader's judgment to form whatever moral evaluations they might like. I mean, we're talking with memorialization about an act of morality, an act of veneration. You know, that, that deserves a moral assessment. But if I were to write a biography prepossessed about the morality of the figure, or in any way um, aiming to convince my reader about the, the sort of moral probity or the absence of it, I think that's a different genre than what I regard as really the practice of historical research. I mean, not everyone will regard that as, you know, the the, the, the point. The the distinguished historian of Nazism, Richard Evans, who was a fellow of Keyes when I was an undergraduate there, remember gave us a very memorable lecture in which he pointed out at great length why he refused to use um, evaluative adjectives to describe Nazi extermination policies because he regarded it as self-evidently objectionable. And I thought, well, that's the sort of nateless ultra of the case, if you see what I mean. Um, to my mind, that, that struck me as rather strange, but, um, but I can see his point. He was so devoted to what I think Nell rightly pointed out as the sort of Rankian task of reconstructing the past from a supposedly objective perspective, disembodied or morally neutral, that he felt he could complete this task in such a way. It might be rather complacent to assume that your readers share the moral uh, perspective of, uh, of the impossible and enlightened individual who would know that Hume's conduct was objectionable. Um, and you do often see that in the biographies of Hume, the most recent being James Harris's at the University of St. Andrews, which doesn't necessarily cast any moral judgment on Hume's conduct, but leaves it to the reader to make that inference. Um, that's just my personal judgment, rather like Richard Evans, but it's not a, you know, it's not a type of historical policy or card carrying um, credo or something. I can see Nell sort of shaking her head animatedly. So I, I <laughs> have that qualification. No, uh, what I'm shaking my head about, and, and then also uh, smiling and agreeing with you sometimes, is that uh, I feel as a historian, you need to say everything. And you need to say it in a way that readers who disagree with you will be able to believe what you have to say. 
that you you need to craft a narrative that is um, well, it's faithful to the archive. I guess that's one way of saying it. Uh, but at the same time, I think your authorial voice as a historian also needs to situate you clearly morally. I mean, maybe you're not uh, every other page sort of knocking your person on the head for, for um, bad deeds or bad thoughts, but I think your situation as, as an author uh, bears a responsibility that you're not simply leaving it up to your reader. If you give your reader enough information, your reader will reach her own conclusions, but that doesn't mean that you can't have any. Um, thank you, Nell. I've been putting Harry off for a while, so I need Okay, to. sorry, Harry. No, no, no problem. I, I, I just wanted to maybe it's it's related to Aditya's question, although a bit of a you know flipping Aditya's question a little bit, but also something that I think didn't come up. And Glenn, Glenn, I think you've told me before, and we, I don't think we've necessarily talked about this. The question of you know why do we even bother memorializing people in the first place? I mean, is that even something that's worth doing? Um, and that's I think that's a legitimate question, and I, I would say that I'm not necessarily some, but I don't actually think that it is necessarily worth doing. But I guess that on that point, um, Aditya is saying, who would want to take the Fisher lecture now um, with Fisher's name on it? I, I might ask, who would want to take any honor, uh, given what's happening? In accepting an honor from somebody, do you not, are you not also giving them the right to later dishonor you? Um, it certainly seems to be the case. And you might argue that as long as you're not doing something as egregious as Fisher, that you shouldn't be worried. But it certainly seems that, uh, you know, that that's not something that anybody would, would judge themselves that harshly. So um, I would just wonder if there's any uh, thoughts on that matter. Harry, as you yourself said, we're not judging Fisher. Fisher on minor misdemeanors. These are major issues having to do with race. People who are going to be dis, uh, uh, memorialized or dishonored will not be because of uh, minor um, transgressions. We're not talking about minor transgressions. We're talking about major issues that have affected the lives of millions. Certainly, but if, if these, are, these are major issues to maybe us and perhaps even people of his day, not, not enough of the people of his day to avoid honoring him apparently, but in Fisher's case, I can only imagine that he did not assume that he was an evil person, that he did not look upon himself as an evil person. So uh, he would not have expected this, you know, had he even had the chance to accept this honor, which he didn't, I believe it was given to him posthumously. So. I don't necessarily know if that's exactly relevant to this case. Um, so I'd just like to add that um, in terms of your, well, your first question about why even memorialize, what is the importance? Um, again, you see memorializing in, throughout all human cultures throughout time. And for me, one quote that I'll read that really hammers home the point of why human beings in society memorialize is that it's considering that which is disappearing itself as essential. So if you do not memorialize, if you do not remember, it will disappear. Um, whether it's intellectual knowledge, whether it's certain values, whether it's certain events and memories, that disappearing aspect you want it to remain essential, but it also forms intergenerational links. Um, particularly when we're talking about scholarly contributions or intellectual contributions. When I think about philosophy and I think about canons, what they're transmitting, um, what questions and answers do they think me and the present and in the future need to be continued? So I think we can always judge and critique what are those questions and what are those answers, who's relevant, but the actual process of memorializing, of remembering, of keeping what's essential, um, I think that it does have some value with it. 
Um, but again, it does bring worries. If anything we do in the living or even for the past can be remembered or dishonored, you are cast into the public light. But I think as scholars, as academics, we're already doing work where we want it to be memorable. We want it to be salient and some of it will be forgotten. Um, some of us might want our work. So my work on racism and decolonization, I want to eventually be forgotten. I want it to be irrelevant um, because these processes don't exist. That doesn't say like we shouldn't still study this because there's always a, a case of new colonization, new racism. Um, so I always waver between those two um, stances of wanting the work to be forgotten, but always wanting it to be studied. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it's complicated. <laughs> I see Nell's laughing. Um, but I think even if you're talking about science, if we're talking about philosophy, um, statistics, there are going to be some of us whose work merit that remembering, that there is something essential you've done in this world that needs to be continued on to future generations. I think just monuments and memorials are just one way we do it. Um, literary canons are another way. Um, timekeeping. Again, Pierre Nora, who now referenced, thought of the calendar as a lieu de memoir, as a way of remembering how we actually relate to time. Um, so for him, the calendar and the clock was a memorial, even if we don't normally think of that in the every day, but we, most of the world uses the Gregorian calendar. Um, we don't have to, we can obviously change that, but it's salient for certain reasons. Um, so that's all I'd like to add. You mentioned Pierre Nora. Pierre Nora is alive. I was wrong. He's 89. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Nell. Uh, let me uh, raise, let me remind, uh, bring up something Nell also said, uh, which was a suggestion. I think it was Nell said this that uh, we have an opportunity to name things after a lot of other people. Yeah, women. We're including women, for example. Um, uh, you should name them only after women now. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I wondered if uh, some of the other members of the audience or the panel think that's a. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Should we should we keep naming things? Should we have all our lectures named after other after uh, people who've made contributions, or should we stop this naming? Uh, what is the attitude of our? Uh, a panel and our other uh, audience here. Yes, we should name them, but if we find out if they, that they have been, uh, you know, racist or racialist or any other such uh, nonsensical thing, we should be dis. Uh, there's no other way, but we should name them, memorialize them. It's part of our legacy. It's uh, people we look for, um, upon. But uh, if we find out that, you know, they've transgressed in major ways, then we should be denamed. Maybe we should have probationary. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe we should have probationary, uh, you know, periods uh, <laughs> like we do for assistant professors or something. But what does other people think? Uh, are we, do we need these names? Glenn, you've muted yourself. Uh, sorry, uh, I was just saying, is it helpful to our communities to have these named things uh, to, create a community? Is that something we should want to continue? Uh, in, perhaps in the way now suggests, but uh, anyway, uh, what, do, what do other people think? I guess like while other people think I can give my opinion. I think it's, uh, and I think it serves other purposes other than veneration also. For example, if, if there are young students uh, in a department uh, doing their PhDs or something like that, and they hear, oh, you know, the Doob lecturer this year is this. They'll be like, oh, okay, who's Doob? You know, wh what did he do? And, you know, why does he have a lecture? So, you know, I can imagine that, you know, for historical reasons or for other reasons, if, if uh, it, it can make people even outside the field curious, if they hear the Hawking lecturer in physics is this, or people like, okay, well, I mean, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, who's Hawking? What did he do? And, um, you know, I'm, same with women, like I think we should honor women as well. But I guess the point is that I, I think there's nothing wrong with the practice itself because I think it serves many purposes other than on, other than honoring the person. It helps make people outside the field curious. It makes help make youngsters curious about what happened before 
and um, and as long as we hold everybody to the standards that okay if history uncovers that uh, they they didn't lead the greatest lives then we should be okay with dememorializing them as well and not get too too attached to the memorialization that's my opinion so what do you think of my suggestion for the next 5 years all the uh named things should be after women yeah go for it i'm i'm actually yeah uh, huh? i i, I think, says no <laughs> Nothing should be taken against uh, women. We should give, be given the same rights, but not more and not less. I know, but you've been saying that for like 200 years and look where we are. <laughs> this is Sarah. I, I think of colleagues in a couple of different fields I, I work in and those memorializations to people that have died, like those colleagues that you really love and that have made a big impact in the field. So less achievement based and more about those who have devoted their life to a field and and memorializing people as a kind of a gesture of affection versus achievement based memorializations good idea good uh, idea paul, uh, paul had uh, raised his hand but i think that's a very, i think what sarah said is a very good idea because people in intellectual fields are going to be have their memorialization just from the work they've done or or wasn't that important after all right i mean why do we need to memorialize fisher or pearson or anybody else if the work will stand for itself but people who did heroic things uh, won't be remembered unless we memorialize them so i think what sarah said was pretty important uh deborah had a comment to uh Uh, I was inviting Deborah to say something about what she wrote in the chat. Uh, I think Deborah is still muted. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you mean the last thing um, about the Cox Prize? I mean, I wrote a few things in there. I was um, in that comment. I said that when people give money to uh, start a prize or a, and a lecture to go with it. Um, they don't agree to have the name stripped later on. So I think I think the one thing that hadn't been mentioned is um, the importance of being able to get contributions, and the contributions are going to go um, to a person that you want to honor not so much um, an idea like who did work in experimental design or something like that. So that would go away if we didn't um, memorialize. I also think that people tend to ignore history and, and there's some detrimental consequences of, of doing away with uh, these names because people won't look back and they can um, learn a lot from doing so. I don't know if that's what you wanted me to comment on. Whatever you wanted to comment on. Uh, <laughs> um, we are, as uh, academics, we tend to want to memorialize ourselves. Uh, um, Nelson, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> what comes to mind is, you know, we have these academic, we have these in statistics in particular, maybe a little different in other fields, uh, most of the people we train don't become academics and professors. They go out and become practicing statisticians. And some of them are very uh, influential, do very important work at leading statistics organizations, uh, doing, uh, you know, uh, working for the uh, public good, public health, uh, for the census, whatever. Um, and make many important innovations, but they are kind of mathematical innovations that uh, we like to teach uh, in the university. Um, I don't know, you know, whether the American Statistical Association, now I'm talking very specifically, but for example, the American Statistical Association 
and the Interna Institute of International Statistics, uh, International Statistical Institute, uh, we may, you know, there are people there, we probably should honor more than we have, is my only comment. That's a kind of off our topic. But. Uh, do, do we, have we run out of steam here? We can keep going if people are, uh, but we have been at it for four hours. Uh, so uh, let me uh, give, uh, if there's someone that has wants one more chance to make a comment. Um, going, going, gone. Okay, well, I wanna thank all our panelists for a very inspirational, uh, I think uh, they set us on a very interesting discussion and uh, uh, thank you so much. So I'm going to, uh, I don't think I'm in control of this meeting, but.